Good morning. Welcome to another Sunday Bible Bites. We're a Moyot Christian Fellowship. To be a part of our ministry, all you need to do is hit the like and subscribe button. And if you would, hit the notification button. That way you'll be notified when a new video drops. We are Moyot Christian Fellowship. <laughs> Hey, good morning. Thanks for being with us. Uh, today, we've had some uh, lively conversation, as we always do, uh, before, during, and after we share a common meal together. Uh, as Brother Brian has mentioned many times, you know, we gather at one of our homes each and every Sunday, and I looked it up this morning. We have been doing this for 19 months. For 19 months, every three weeks, it's one of our turns, to host this uh, this gathering of men in our homes and prepare breakfast and uh, have fellowship and, and sometimes have communion and talk about just the unfortunately some of the crazy things that are going on in the United States today. So uh, we want to be thankful for what we have, but we want to be ever so cautious about what we might lose. So let's open with the prayer. And dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today. We're so thankful for your abundant grace. We're thankful uh, for the many blessings you bestow on us. We're thankful for the beautiful weather you've given us today. It's cooling off here in North Carolina, and uh, that's kind of welcome and, and kind of sad because it means we won't be sitting out by the pool or going to the beach and doing things in the warm weather we normally do. But that is uh, by your uh, you know, divine, uh, you, you gave that to us. You gave us the four seasons, and, and we're lucky to have that. Uh, we ask that you be with the uh, leaders of our country that, uh, quite frankly, are uh, heading us down a path to socialism and destruction. Uh, we hope that can be curbed. Uh, we hope that uh, some of our leaders will stand up for what's right. Some of the Democratic leaders are starting to do that themselves. Uh, we need people in government that can carry out uh, your mandate for us, your will for us, and that we can all live as neighbors and for those who may not understand that term neighbor, neighbor is everyone other than you. Everyone's a neighbor. And we need to be kind to each other. And we need to look out for each other. And I want to say a special uh, prayer request for uh, the Reverend uh, T. Michael Williams. Uh, used to be pastor of a church here in Moyoc. He is uh, uh, suffering from diabetes and uh, last we heard was in a diabetic coma. Uh, so we, we pray that your healing hand will uh, help him regain the strength necessary to over, overcome this bout uh, of diabetic coma. Uh, we ask you to be with each of us and our families and all of our neighbors in the coming days. And as always, we ask these things in your son's precious name. Amen. All right, today uh, we're moving into the book of Isaiah. All right, now this is a prophetic book. Uh, and the next 16 books of the Old Testament were all written by prophets. And the Old Testament, of course, ends with the book of Malachi, the last prophet. Each prophet had to live by a code that was spelled out in the book of Deuteronomy. All right, the basic premise of this code uh, was that whatever you said or prophesied in the name of God had to actually come true. Now, the prophets uh, prophesied about local things, and, and most of what they prophesied about was local events that were to come. Some were not local, but it was the local ones that could get uh, some of these prophets in trouble because everybody knew whether or not it actually came true or not. All right, so if it didn't come true, that prophet was labeled, you guess it, a false 
prophet. You've all heard that word before, that term, false prophet. And they were treated as false prophets. All right. This job of being a prophet wasn't one of the jobs you could fake. You simply could not fake it without getting caught. So everybody had to be, uh, had to be sure that what they were saying was, in fact, a message from God about something that was going to come. All right. In the modern days, we're still seeing people trying to fake it, though. Do you remember the name Jim Baker? Or his wife, Tammy Faye Baker? How about Kenneth Copeland? Jesse Duplantis? Joel Osteen? Now, I'm not going to call them uh, necessarily false prophets, uh, but I am going to say that we need to look very closely at what these pastors are doing and saying. All right. Now, what I just read off, that's a very, very short list of some of the pastors that have enriched themselves in the name of the Lord. Now, here's something that is real important here. Jesus Christ called his followers to leave everything behind and follow him. None were made rich by following Jesus. They gave up everything. Working for Jesus Christ, serving the Lord, has never been for the purpose of enriching oneself. But here's the thing. I'm stumped as to how any pastor could ever justify having not just one mega mansion, but multiple mega mansions. Now, in Austin's defense, he hasn't taken a salary from his church since 2005. No salary. Now, every Sunday, his church welcomes through its doors over 50,000 members of the congregation. 50,000. But I want to share with you a couple quotes to kind of put all this in perspective. First one is this. It's God's will for you to live in prosperity instead of poverty. Yeah, you hear that? God's will for us to live in prosperity instead of poverty. Now, here's the next one. I believe God wants us to be examples of what it means to live for Him and that our money is to be a blessing for others. That sounds kind of good. Here's the last quote, though. If you would be perfect, go. Sell what you possess and give it to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven. And come, follow me. All right, the first two quotes come from Joel Osteen. In these quotes, Joel was trying to uh, defend his extreme wealth, his private jets, his mansions. The last quote, of course, is from Jesus Christ on how we should be living. You see the conflict? Austin's quotes come from his own version of theology, not God's. I want to share with you one more scripture uh, to kind of bring this all home for you, I hope. It comes from 1 Timothy 6, 6-11, and it says this, but godliness with contentment is great. For we brought nothing into this world, and we can take nothing with us. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content in that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs." Alright, so 
this is not bash the wealthy and opulent pastor day, but rather it's a segue into the first chapter of Isaiah. This chapter is titled Rebellious Nation in the New International Version. And what we'll be reading from the New International Version today simply because it's easier uh, for everyone to understand than if I read from the King James Version, which, which is the most preferred. All right. In preparing for this week's message, however, uh, I was kind of at this point when I thought God was shifting this week's message away from the first chapter of Isaiah to the question of, is being rich what God wants for us? This shift in today's message will mesh very well with what Isaiah has to say in chapter 1. So the question becomes, is getting rich really what God wants for us, as Joe Losting says? The scripture answers this question very definitively, I think. What we find far too often is that those who are not following scripture like to use their position of authority in the church to say things in the scripture that simply aren't there. They do this because most folks don't know the scriptures, unfortunately, and simply aren't going to fact check guys like Kenneth Copeland and Joel Austin. This, my friends, is deception compounded by greed. And that's a topic for another sermon. Joel Osteen and Kenneth Copeland are among the wealthiest preachers in the world. And I'll admit that they probably do need the use of a private jet. I'm going to give them that. Their schedules are absolutely insane and crazy and hectic and it literally would be impossible for them to meet all of their commitments without the use of a jet. I also can't deny that each brings more souls to know Jesus Christ each year than about everyone else combined. But there, uh, there does come a point in building wealth where you no longer uh, have just what you need, but greed drives you to want more. Now, I'm throwing up real quick a video from Kenneth Copeland uh, explaining uh, the perils of flying commercial. Filled world right. and get in an air, get in a long tube with a bunch of demons, 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 demons. Right, that's exactly the And it, it's deadly. And it All right, now here's the problem with... Uh, what Kenneth Copeland just said. He lumps all passengers on commercial airliners into just one group of demonic people. He says they're all demons. Everybody on a commercial plane is demon. He can't get he can't get his work done on a plane. He can't pray. He can't connect with God because there's demons all over the plane. You know? It was only a couple years ago that a group of people led by one woman decreed that all Republicans were deplorables. You could put half of Trump supporters into what I call the basket of deplorables. Second, F. Kenneth Copeland's statement is true that the plane is full of all these demonic souls that are interfering with his ability to be in, in contact and up close and personal with God, then what about his calling by God to save souls? If there are demonic souls on the plane, why isn't he saving them? Why is he hopping on a private jet and hiding from them? He should be on that plane, up close, in front, and personal with those demonic souls he's talking about. Apparently, I am one. Everyone I know apparently is one because we all fly on planes. I hope there's a pastor out there that would come save us if that were truly the case. All right, next, here's a clip 
of uh, Kenneth Copeland talking to a reporter from Inside Edition, and, and I have to admit, she kind of uh, sandbagged him. She called him when he wasn't prepared to be caught by anybody. So he was getting off his private jet, of which he has five, and hopping into his uh, limousine to, to head home or somewhere. And she asked him this question. Take a look at this. Into a tube with a bunch of demons. Do you really believe that human beings are demons? No, I do not. And don't you ever say I did. We wrestle not with flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. All right, this, this is a pretty scary video clip. Did you see his eyes and his facial expression as he lurched over that car door at the reporter? Did you see those eyes? Look at it again, here's a still. All right, Brother Mark, Brother Brian and I Sadly and unfortunately, we witnessed a United Methodist pastor lurch over a table, enraged with anger and, and venomance. And these, these my friends, I tell you, these are very telling events. All right, we need to think very carefully about who the true demons really are. The last clip uh, I want to share with you before I move on uh, is an important one too. In this one, Kenneth Copeland explains what line of work he is actually in. Take a look. But right. we're in we're in we're in soul business here. Right. You hear that? Show business. Kenneth Copeland just told the world on video, he, he's not a preacher, he's not here to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, he's not a disciple of Jesus Christ, he's not in ministry, ministry. he says he's in show business. Show business! You can't make this stuff up, folks. This is where so many have gone wrong. When did preaching the gospel become show business? Something for someone to profit off of so they can buy more mansions and more jets. But it's not just pastors becoming show business celebrities. Our government leaders are becoming show people too. Instead of being our elected representatives, they too have become wealthy show people as luck, possibly bad luck for us would have it, as they make more and more money, they become more and more greedy. They start to compromise not only their moral values, but our moral values. What they're doing in Congress and the Senate right now, today, is very like an to a drug deal. As they compromise their own morals and they make these quid pro quo, I can't even say that word, quid pro quo uh, deals with other congressmen and other senators where they say, hey look, I'll, I'll vote for your bill even if it's a really bad one, as long as you vote for my equally bad bill. That's how things get done in Congress. What are the American people getting out of this? What do we derive from it? In Isaiah's day, the world was in great upheaval just like it is today. A hostile army was trying to conquer the world. We currently have China trying to conquer us and our government's doing nothing about it. Our country is in great upheaval right now. Parents around the country are standing up for their, their child's right to an education free of indoctrination. It's almost unimaginable that that's where we are today. The integrity of our voting system has been questioned and we've got no answers. 
Our economy is in the tank right now, and COVID mandates are literally violating our constitutional rights. The blundered Afghanistan withdrawal has, has left Americans bewildered, and we left Americans behind. They're still there, hoping to get out. And right now, the only countries around the world who are happy with what's happening in the United States, Russia and China, they love what's going on right now. It was as if they designed it themselves, and possibly they did. All right, this chapter was written thousands of years ago between 700 and 680 BC. Uh, but it has so many similarities to where we are today in 2021. All right, I'm going to put this entire scripture that I'm about to read up on the screen so you can follow along because there, there's a lot here. And I think it's important that you, you see it in case some of you don't have your Bibles handy. So I'm just going to throw it up on the screen uh, so you can follow along with me. All right. We're in Isaiah chapter 1. Listen to this and, and hear the similarities between what God uh, is saying through Isaiah about uh, Judea, Judea and, uh, or Judah, I'm saying it wrong, Judah, and, and how it so closely mirrors what we're seeing today. Hear me, you heavens, listen, earth, for the Lord has spoken. I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. All right, now right here, God is talking about his children in Judah. Am I saying that right? Judah. I'm having a hard time speaking this morning. All right, like children, he raised them up, but now they are rebelling against him. Get this, the ox knows its master, the donkey its owner's manger. All right, this is really interesting. God chooses two of the least intelligent creatures on earth to illustrate his children here. But Israel does not know. My people do not understand. All right, so God believes at this point that his children have forgotten he is the master. Woe to the sinful nation, a people whose guilt is great, a brood of evildoers, children given to corruption. They have forsaken the Lord, they have spurned the Holy One of Israel, and turned their backs on him. Why should you be beaten anymore? Why do you persist in rebellion? Your whole head is injured, your whole heart afflicted. From the sole of your foot to the top of your head, there is no soundness. Only words, wounds, and welts, and open sores, not cleansed or bandaged or soothed with olive oil. Your country is desolate. Your cities burned with fire. Your fields are being stripped by foreigners right before your eyes. Laid waste as when overthrown by strangers. All right. Allies around the world are stepping back from the U.S. right now. They see the U.S. president stepping back from them. We're becoming a desolate nation ourselves. In the summer two of 2020, we watched some of our most liberal cities burn to the ground as their liberal leaders did nothing to stop the arsonists. And guess what else? Our fields are being harvested by, by who? Who's harvesting our fields? Illegal aliens, foreigners. See that comparison? Daughter Zion is left. 
like a shelter in the vineyard, like a hut in a cucumber field, like a city under siege. Unless the Lord Almighty had left us some survivors. All right, survivors. Now in the King James Version, survivors doesn't appear, remnants appears. All right, little remnants, like crumbs from a, a loaf of bread. That's what was left. But without a remnant, there would be nothing left to build upon. We would have become like Sodom. We would have been like Gomorrah. All right, 700 years before Isaiah, God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Jesus Christ would later say that God's destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah was a sign of his judgment against evil, a lesson we still haven't learned today. Hear the word of our Lord. You rulers of Sodom, listen to the instruction of God, you people of Gomorrah. The multitude of your sacrifices, what you are to me, says the Lord, I have more than enough burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fatted animals, fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls or lambs and goats. All right, so right now what God's doing is he's spelling out the charges against Judah, just like a prosecutor would in court. He's laid out the charges. Now he's getting ready to prosecute the case and punish the evildoers. When you come to appear before me as if he's the judge and he's the ultimate judge, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts, stop bringing meaningless offerings, your incense is detestable to me, new moons, Sabbaths, and convocations, I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. I saw what God is saying here is that going through the motions of pleasing God without living it out in your hearts, absolutely meaningless. And so that's where I kind of get back into wondering about the motives of Kenneth Copeland and Joel Osteen and some of those other mega church pastors. What are they doing? And is it in their heart or is it meaningless? You new moon feast on your appointed festivals. I hate with all my being. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight and stop doing wrong. Learn to do right, seek justice, and defend the oppressed. That seems like a basic commandment to me. Learn to do what's right, seek justice, and defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless, Plead the case of the widow. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like a scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are as red as crimson, they shall be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat good things of the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. See how the faithful city has become a prostitute. All right, remember what I said earlier about the, the quid pro quo system of our government? Our leaders are literally prostituting themselves 
and us for riches. We're victims. She once was full of justice. We were once full of justice. Righteousness used to dwell in her, but now murderers. Your silver has become dross. Your choice wine is diluted with water. Your rulers are rebels, partners with thieves. They all love bribes and chase after gifts. All right, if you thought that was some politician back in the 1950s or so who came up with the idea of kissing babies and photo ops, here's your sign. They do not defend the cause of the fatherless. The widow's case does not come before them. 680 years after Isaiah's death, Jesus Christ would command us to do for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine one of many ways Isaiah's prophecies are proven true. Therefore the Lord, the Lord Almighty, the Mighty One of Israel declares, Ah, I will vent my wrath on my foes and avenge myself on my enemies. I will turn my hands against you. I will thoroughly purge away your dross. I will remove all of your impurities. I will restore your leaders as in the days of old, your rulers as at the beginning. Afterward, you will be called the city of the righteousness, the faithful city. Zion will be delivered with justice or penitence, ones with righteousness. God is giving Judah an opportunity of forgiveness and grace. It all depends on their response at this point. But rebels and sinners will both be broken, and those who forsake the Lord will perish. You will be ashamed because of the sacred oaks in which you have delighted. You will be disgraced because of the gardens that you have chosen. You will be like an oak with fading leaves with a garden without water. What God is talking about right here is idolatry. Idols were placed under oak trees at that time and gardens were planted around them. The mighty man will become tender and his work a spark. Both will burn together with no one to quench the fire. All right, the Lord Jesus Christ gives each one of us the opportunity offered by God to Judah, a chance to be renewed in him, uh, for our sins to be washed away. The Reverend Vernon McGee said that God judges nations. He raises up nations. He puts them down. Our country uh, has been rebelling against, against God. We know that. It's clear. And I think he's sending us a message right now. He's ready to judge us. And I think what he's doing is offering us an olive branch of redemption. I hope we can grab a hold of that branch lest we all be destroyed. My question is this. Are you taking the hand that Jesus Christ is offering you right now? Or are you boarding that plane full of demons with Kenneth Copeland. Our prayers for each of you is that you come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, that you welcome Him into your hearts and your minds, and that you repent for your sins and allow Jesus to save your soul. Amen.